a very good colleague and uh, friend through the years. Uh, Artemis is a researcher at the Berlin uh, Brandenburg Academy uh, of Sciences in Germany, where she is one of the editors of the Corpus of Cypriot Syllabic Inscriptions of the First Millennium BC for the series Inscriptiones Grecia. She has a BA from the Department of History and Archaeology of the University of Thessaloniki from 1993, and a MA from the Department of Archaeology of the University of Sheffield in, uh, in the United Kingdom, and a PhD with a thesis on the Cretan, the Cretan hieroglyphic script of the second millennium BC uh, from the University of Brussels in Belgium. Her research interests include archaeology and epigraphy of the Eastern Mediterranean from the third to the first millennium BC. She has excavated extensively in different sites in Greece as a contract employee back in those days uh, at the Greek Ministry of Culture, and she has taught uh, at the graduate and graduate courses at the University of Crete and has done postdoctoral research at the University of Cambridge and Vienna. Uh, Artemis is very modest uh, on her CV, and uh, I wanted to honor that, so I'm not going to uh, tell you what extensive work she has done, but she has published extensively. She's one of very, very few people that they are actually uh, specialists in linear A as well, and uh, uh, the script from the first millennium. And because of her extensive uh, work, we were very pleased in uh, Greek archaeology that she was elected uh, as an assistant professor at the University of Crete uh, for prehistoric uh, archaeology. Congratulations, Artemis, and thank you very much for joining us here. Among you, so I'm going to make a big introduction about our research topics because I've noticed that even in my field, uh, the field of prehistoric and syllabic epigraphy, when I speak about the things I speak, even my colleagues are not very well acquainted with all the facts. So I decided to do this big introduction for you. So I will start uh, with uh, some thoughts on how. I arrived at structure my talk for tonight. Um, and it is a common it's common knowledge that the reconstruction of ancient periods and evidence of facts that happened in the past, that is the investigation and writing of history, uh, started out in our age, and I mean the post-Renaissance world, through examination of written texts. History was thought uh, could only be produced when written texts existed. Texts would testify to the existence of empires. Can I just lower this a little bit? I'm sure. <laughs> I think that's great. So texts testify to the existence of empires, their rulers, events, and even disasters of biblical proportions. History started in the minds of scholars and the public alike when writing was invented and some enlightened people thought of taking down the lives and deeds of their contemporaries, and even managed to insert some accounts, sometimes in the form of myths and fables, of peoples that had lived before them. We think nowadays, however, and this is a relatively recent development in the history of our discipline, archaeology, that we can actually produce history out of objects. Our focus has also changed. We're not only interested in writing the history of elites and their adventures, but we are keen on investigating multiple social layers. We like to be more holistic in our approach of the past, less judgmental and dismissive, and more inquisitive and open to what we find, even when we find things that we don't really like. We are nonetheless plagued by what could be called presentism, and this is a word I picked up on the internet and I like it very much, that is we're mostly interested in discovering aspects of the past that are also concerned to our contemporary world. As if I needed proof of that, I think that the number of studies concerned with the notion of identity, cultural, ethnic, political, etc., demonstrates my point. That said, I would like tonight to show you uh, how one of the oldest disciplines in the realm of archaeology 
uh, and studies of the ancient world in general, the discipline of epigraphy, that is the study of ancient inscriptions, how this discipline survives and creates in the 21st century AD. My study case will be the secret syllabary of the first millennium BC, which is what I study and is also very befitting since we happen to be on Cyprus, the island where it all happened. So, let us first momentarily travel back in time as far as the third millennium and even the beginning of the so-called Old World scripts, around the end of the fourth millennium BC. Writing was invented, it is believed, independently in Mesopotamia and Egypt around that time, that is, the end of the fourth millennium BC. Throughout the third millennium, the cuneiform and the Egyptian writing systems, the latter in their two main versions, hieroglyphic and hieratic, the only ones available. It is believed that the Egyptian writing systems were scarcely copied or adopted as models for other writing systems. The explanations offered by scholars for this relative isolation are the apparent introversion of the Egyptian culture and the difficulty of the writing system itself. Cuneiform, on the other hand, born and developed out of Mesopotamia, was adopted and used by a variety of cultures and peoples of many diverse languages the degree that some eight different languages are known to have been recorded throughout some 3,000 years of cuneiform use. The second millennium, however, sees a series of changes and innovations. The cuneiform script reaches as far west as central Anatolia, and it is the first writing system that came to be used in this part of the world. It is primarily used on the spot in Anatolia to record an Indo-European language, the Kite, but because of the common writing system, trade and cultural contacts with the Middle East are facilitated. Another writing system, invented and used concomitantly in southeastern Anatolia, and what is today northern Syria, is the hieroglyphic Hittite script, which, when deciphered, turned out to be recording the Lubian language. It therefore changed its name into hieroglyphic Lubian. Hieroglyphic Lubian survived into the first couple of centuries of the first millennium BC. So. Another interesting development that took place in what we could collectively call today Syro-Palestine in the second millennium is the invention of the first thoroughly alphabetic scripts. The writing systems, which had been used up to that date, were the so-called logosyllabic writing systems. That is, scripts that used a single sign, the logogram, or so-called ideogram, as you will find it mostly in bibliography, to denote either a whole word or a syllable. The Egyptian writing systems and the cuneiform script were such logographic writing systems, as had, as had been hieroglyphic Nubian. But in Syro Palestine, the region where Mesopotamian influences met with the Egyptian ones, the second millennium saw the further breaking down of words into phonemes. And this is how the concept of alphabetic writing came into effect for the first time. In Ugarit, Port side in today's Ras Shamra in Syria, cuneiform writing was reduced to 30 signs which denoted single phonemes. At the same time, in the Sinai Peninsula, another alphabetic script is attested in the second millennium BC, the so called Proto Sinaitic, which, when found in Canaan, comes under the name Proto Canaanite or Old Canaanite. The Proto Sinaitic writing system is a clear development from the Egyptian scripts. And the possibility exists that the Phoenician alphabet could also have derived through this script. But the development in the history of writing systems that is of interest to us today takes, us, takes place in Crete. There, around the turn of the 3rd to the 2nd millennium BC, two writing systems are invented, the Cretan hieroglyphic and linear A. It is probable that the idea of writing in Crete was borrowed by the culture that invented these two, my own culture, from elsewhere. Yet, it is not clear if the idea came from Egypt or the East. That is, if the Egyptian scripts or the cuneiform were the source of inspiration, since Crete appears to have been in contact with both these cultural environments. In any case, the script that lasted longer and became the hallmark of the minor civilization is the Near Both these writing systems remain to this day undeciphered, no matter what people say to the contrary. 
It is therefore of particular and extremely lively interest to scholars and public alike the matter of which is the language or languages recorded by these two scripts. The unofficial opinion communis is that they recorded a language or more other than Greek, representing populations that lived in Crete, or more broadly in what is today known as Greece, populations that were living there before the coming of the Greeks. Such an assumption remains, however, to be proven. These two scripts were used during the first half of the second millennium BC, initially in Crete, during the period archaeologists call Old Palatial, because it is the period when the first the Cretan palaces first appeared. So subsequently, the script started being used outside Crete during the New Palatial period, a period when the Cretan palaces took their final shape, and it is the one we see today when we visit sites such as Knossos, Maya, and Zagros. The script was used in some islands of the Aegean, as well as in Asia Minor and the Peloponnesian coast, and some documents reached as far as Samothrace in the north of the Aegean Sea. What happened in the second half of the millennium is that Linear A was adopted by the populations that inhabited the Greek mainland as far north as Thessaly, populations that are known under the collective name Mycenaeans. The Mycenaeans were a Greek-speaking population. They therefore seem to have adjusted the script to their needs, namely the needs of the Greek language. So the adaptation of Linear A matched the needs of a new population, of a new administration, and in all probability, a new language has been named Linear B. This is the first time that the Greek language was recorded in Linear B was the first writing system ever to have been used for its registration. And you see again the map of the Eastern Mediterranean and Mesopotamia with Linear B and the Greek language being present at the eastern edge of this vast area that made use of writing in the second millennium BC. We know a lot of details about the Linear B writing system, which was deciphered as recently as 1952. What is interesting for us here is that Linear B, as much as its predecessor Linear A and its coetaneous Cretan hieroglyphic, were all writing systems of the logosyllabic type. That is, as I said, they used signs to denote all words, as well as syllables. The signs that are grouped, and you see them in blue, uh, stand for syllables, and the signs that stand isolated uh, stand for logograms or ideograms, that is, for a whole word and they are circled by red colors. Although not deciphered, we are confident that the Cretan hieroglyphic and linear A also belong to this kind of writing system because of the total number of signs they possess, as well as how these writing systems appear to have been structured. So going back to our map again, it is interesting that in the second millennium BC, when the concept of the alphabet was already in place, the Aegean opts for writing systems of the logosyllabic type. This observation aims only to stress that the history of writing is by no means linear or unidirectional. People may be informed of inventions and technical advances of their time, but it remains always a personal and, in the instance of writing, a social choice, whether to adopt them or not. Writing is a particular case in point uh, in that it appears to be an inherently conservative technology, more so than language itself. So let's also visit briefly Cyprus, uh, the biggest island of the Eastern Mediterranean, which is situated very, very close to the Syro-Palestinian coast and the area in general where the cuneiform script reigns supreme. Archaeological discoveries demonstrate that during the second millennium, the island had close contacts with the with its east, as well as Anatolia in the north, but very little with the west, namely Crete. It is, however, remarkable that the writing system that appears in Cyprus in the 16th century BC, the so named Cyber Minoan, is believed by researchers that have been an offspring of the Minoan linear A. We assume, therefore, that some sort of close contact exist existed between Crete and Cyprus. The main evidence for which is the adoption of my non writing systems in Cyprus. It is not readily understandable how or why the Cyprus my non writing systems sprang from Linear A, that is, 
um, the whole process is, remains obscure. It is a fact, and a widely accepted one too, however, that the borrowing and subsequent adaptation took place in the mid-second millennium BC, and Sartre Minoan writing is assumed to have developed into at least three different forms, varieties, named Sartre Minoan 1, 2, and 3. The second millennium ended in turmoil in many parts of the old world, but in the Aegean, and subsequently in Cyprus, the events that occurred changed also the picture as far as writing is concerned. The Mycenaean state formations, which were the prime users of writing, collapsed at the end of the 12th century BC, and all trace of writing disappeared. Linea B was never to be used again. The technology of writing is most of the times associated with the existence of an organized state, and script disappearance, or script death, as it has been called, occurs when the supporting official structure crumbles. Script disappearance, on the other hand, does not necessarily mean language disappearance. Language and script, and I would say it again and again, are two totally different concepts, and many languages have existed and continue to exist without ever having been written. The situation in Cyprus appears to have been equally dramatic, in that Cyprus minor scripts are last used in the 11th century BC. We're not certain about the specifics, but it is commonly believed that the disappearance of Cyprus Minoan has to do with the coming of immigrant populations, namely immigrants that fled from the collapsed Mycenaean states. It is with good reason that such a theory is proposed, since when writing appears again in Cyprus, after a hiatus of some three centuries, the predominant language on the island is Greek. So we have to assume at some point in Cypriot history some sort of influx of Greek-speaking populations. Other languages, however, other than Greek, which are known under the collective name Ethio Cypriot, for lack of knowledge of how they were originally called, did not die out. Instead, they coexist on Cyprus alongside Greek as late as the 4th century BC. So the 3rd century hiatus seems to have been valid also for the recording of the Greek language after which the alphabet, the Greek alphabet, that turned out to be the most successful writing system in the history of mankind, made its appearance. The 8th century BC finds most of the Mediterranean using the alphabet in one form or the other. The story is well known and frequently told, how the Phoenicians used an alphabetic script without any vowels, how the Greeks took the Phoenician alphabet and added the vowels, and how the Euboean alphabet spread to the West through Euboean colonies in what is today's Italy. From then on, the alphabet has proved to be enduring and versatile, in that today, some 2,800 years after its invention, it is used for the writing of the majority of the world's languages. But now some more details the case of Cyprus in the first millennium BC. In an island of a little over 9,000 square kilometers, at least three languages were spoken during the first millennium BC. Two that I already mentioned, namely Greek and the poorly understood Ethio Cypriot, as well as Phoenician. It is known that the dominant language throughout the millennium was Greek in its local dialectal form, Cypriot Greek. Greek is thought to have become dominant through processes that are largely unknown to us, and it is this language that is attested in the majority of inscriptions we have at our disposal from the first millennium. The conventional, modern, invented term ethio cypriot language, which was invented by analogy with the Homeric ethio is to be understood as true Cypriot. It is used to indicate one or some researchers do more local languages that presumably pre-existed the arrival of the Greek-speaking populations of the Greek language and survived well into the first millennium. A small number of first millennium inscriptions that can be dated as late as the 4th century BC testify to this language as well. And the third language is a language that is omnipresent in the Mediterranean, namely Phoenician. Phoenician appears to have been spoken and written mainly within the confines of the Cypriot kingdoms that were ruled by Phoenician rulers and are thought to have had a significant portion of Phoenician-speaking populations, 
such as Kithion, today is Monaco, in the southeast part of the island, and Italian, an inland kingdom, which at some point of their history, these two constituted the United Kingdom. Along with the pluralism of languages in the first millennium in Cyprus, a fact which is by no means peculiar to any place on the globe, exceptionally we also have a pluralism of writing systems. Historically, we know that a number of languages can be accommodated under the same writing system and vice versa. That language being a natural institution, while writing constitutes a human-generated technology, they are not always inexorably linked. Writing, in particular, can be invented, adopted, imposed, or discarded at the pace other than that of language. So, although the two are usually examined together, they present us with different phenomena and attitudes, and here, in the case of Cyprus, we have just such an instance. So, although it is thought that the Greek language dominated, it was not written down by use of the Greek alphabet as was the case with the rest of the Greek-speaking world, at least from the 8th century BC onward. An exclusively secret native script, the syllabary, was used to write Greek and is attested between the 8th and the 3rd centuries BC. The first millennium, which saw this tremendously successful expansion of the alphabet, left Greek-speaking Cyprus largely indifferent reinforcing once more the suggestion that writing can fall in trajectory totally different than language. And on the slide you can see a stone inscription in this elaborate. It is a bit deformed because the signs originally contained metal and someone in the course of time tried to extract the metal so they, they destroyed the stone in their effort to take the metal and reuse it. So you see uh, a photo and this is how you, we document our inscriptions. Take a good photo of uh, an inscription, we produce a drawing which is based on this very photo, and then we produce a transcription in normalized computer fonts of this writing system. Then we transcribe it in, the, in syllables, and then if we're lucky enough to understand what it says, we proceed to interpreting something in a known writing system and a known language. So the syllabary is attested in Cyprus in two varieties, the so-called Fomon, since it is used all over the island, and the so-called Paphian, the name deriving from the region of Cyprus in which it was used, namely Paphos in the southwest of the island. The differences between them lie in the different forms of certain signs, and you can see here, for instance, a sign for uh, P and P, it's just different forms of the same sign as well as the direction of writing and reading. The Paphian, much like its siblings, Linear A and Linear B, like twin, um, is written from left to right, whereas the common syllabary is sinistroverse, like the Phoenician alphabet. Again, this can probably be explained on the basis of historical reasons, but such a discussion is beyond the purposes of this presentation. Inscribed objects preserved to this day comprise stone inscriptions, inscriptions on metal and clay, vases and statues, uh, inscriptions on bone, seals and coins, of course. Their content is most of the times a funerary formula or dedication, something very brief and laconic, whereas an object could be dedicated to a deity. A unique bronze tablet from Idalion, which is our most famous and one of the lengthiest documents we have, contains uh, a lengthy legal document. It's actually a legal document. But we know for certain that other perishable documents existed since paint was used on vases, and painted inscriptions present us with what the version of the syllabary that would have been written on parchment or papyrus. More importantly, we're missing the documents that pertain to the public sphere, such as administrative and archival ones, for which we have good evidence that they existed. The gradual discovery in the past 30 years of an important palatial archive in Italian of some 700 ostraga in Phoenician and some 30 in Cypriot syllabic is only a reminder of the evidence we're missing. And as a final general point, if we add all text categories mentioned previously, Overall, very few secret syllabic texts survive, namely some 1,300. 
So a miniature statue from Cyprus kept at the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge offers vital evidence on literate persons in Cyprus. The man, you can see the man, the headless man, sitting in front of a table with a papyrus or a red roll in front of him. I venture to guess that it is some sort of a red leather roll, since a funerary inscription from Marion attests to the profession of literary force, a word explained by Sikius as teacher among the Cypriots. Diftera is skin height, and as a writing medium, it is mentioned by Herodotus, and here you see the passage. It is most likely, therefore, that this statue represents a teacher, whether a teacher also served as a scribe, in the sense of a person responsible for the drafting of archives and correspondence, it is not clear. We have very little clues on who knew how to write and who knew how to read in those times. And we have hardly any evidence for scribes in Cyprus. The statue constitutes evidence, however, of writing media other than the ones that have been handed down to us. For the time being, we can testify that there was probably no cursive version of the script, that scribes on all of their writing media made it a point to keep signs well detached. That's very important. Other than the native Cypriot syllabary, the Greek alphabet as well as the Phoenician alphabet, like I mentioned, are also attested. The Greek alphabet is a late introduction. It comes after the 6th century BC, but it clearly constitutes a cultural import, and it seemingly takes a long time to catch on, since the main bulk of locally produced alphabetic inscriptions date from the 4th century onwards. The Phoenician alphabet, on the other hand, which you see on the right hand side, goes hand in hand with the Phoenician language and the Phoenician speaking populations that settled permanently in Cyprus. And here you see an ostracon from the Italian archive, a logistic economic record produced by the palatial administration written in Phoenician. All these languages and scripts did not function in isolation, instead they coexisted and intersected in various combinations, as did the people who spoke them and wrote them. So, uh, and we are here, the question is, what am I doing here? Uh, as Evi said, I'm uh, one of the editors of the Corpus of Syllabic Inscriptions of the First Millennium. Um, it is imperative in epigraphy to have a good primary edition of the material so that we can base our work and suggestions on it. Uh, the Secret Syllabary, although it was deciphered in 1874, that is, 145 years ago, is still lacking a good primary publication of its inscriptions. And like I said, we have some 1,300 inscriptions, and their importance lies mainly in the fact that they constitute almost the sole witness to, ancient Greek, to the ancient Greek secret dialect. Unlike the rest of the Greek-speaking world, we don't have written texts of any other kind that attest to the dialect. That is, we have no historical accounts, no tragedies, no epigrams of any kind. So we have to rely on these inscriptions and their information in order to reconstruct ancient Greek Cypriot. And for us, we started in 2007, that was a lifetime ago, with a collection of the material, and the first volume with inscriptions from Amathus, Curion and Marion has just been submitted to our editor, De Greuther, and we should have a printed copy in our hands within the first months of this coming year, 2020. Let me just show you one example of how a good primary edition can be useful. It can be useful in many ways, but just one example. We have the instance of the first king of Marion who issued coins. His name was Sasmas. Sasmas is a king with the name of Semitic etymology. But on his coins, he gets a very typically secret syllabic ending, or se. So with the addition of the ending, the name is on one hand Hellenized, but it also gets a secret treatment. His coins also attest to his father's name. Sasmas is the son of Lysandros, a man with the name of clear Greek etymology. I'm happy to report that based on our thorough study of coins for the purposes of the corpus, a study we undertook together with the precious self of our numismatist, Evangelini Marco, we discovered that Sasmas's father name had been erroneously so far read as Doxandros. But it is now certain that the father was named Lysandros. The importance of this piece of information lies in the fact that both Sasmas 
and the examples are not known from any other sources. That is, these coins in the syllabary are, are only evidence of their existence. So getting their names right is by no means self-evident, and an erroneous reading that has survived for some 70 years is now corrected. So why has it taken us so long <laughs> to produce uh, just one volume out of a planned three volumes? So an important um, obstacle in the compilation of a corpus is and always has been the wide dispersion of Cypriot antiquities in general as a result of looting since the 19th century. And of Cypriot inscriptions in particular in museums world, worldwide, here you see where they're kept, in four different continents. So there was a lot of traveling involved. By 2010, we had covered a lot of traveling ground by visiting museums and documenting inscriptions outside Cyprus, namely in Italy, Greece, France, England, Poland, and Sweden, as well as in New York and Philadelphia and the US. Some of these museums, especially the British Museum in London, the Louvre in Paris, which is very well packed and very clean, and the Cabinet de Medaille, in Paris, we visited again after 2010 in order to correct drawings and inscriptions and thus complete our work there. I'm very proud of this picture. This is the Italian tablet. <laughs> yeah. anyway. Additionally, we, um, we paid extend an extended visit to the Artist Museum in Berlin in 2013, as well as the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford in 2014. And here you see one of our working tools, which are uh, inscription squeezes. We make paper squeezes of stone inscriptions. And these squeezes, once made, which is a very easy process, you can store them and you can keep them. We have uh, squeezes at the uh, Inscription Greek and Corpus that are more than 100 years old. Nothing happens to them. They just get a little bit dusty if you're not really careful and don't put them in drawers, but that's it. So this is a, a nice way of copying inscriptions. And in Berlin, we have a lot of inscriptions that are now, the original stones are now lost. So it's the only evidence of their existence. So in all the above museums, the ones outside Cyprus, we try to document all the, the, all the inscriptions, whether they belong to the first volume of the corpus or not. Our goal was achieved for all the above museums, except for the Metropolitan Museum in New York, which houses more than 80 Cypriot inscriptions, because we all know that Chesnola was a very prolific thief. So back in 2010, a visit of 10 days did not prove sufficient, but this is my colleague, Massimo Perna, which some of you may know, and he's very happy. He was very happy when we went to New York. He's going to have to go back on his own again <laughs> to do the rest of the inscriptions. Um, it goes uh, without saying that throughout these past years, extended visits were also paid uh, to Cyprus, where the majority of our material is fortunately housed. We visited every year, except 2014, there was a gap year, in order to document inscriptions, and here's a picture of our colleague Hedwig Ennegren, making a squeeze of a rock cut inscription in the area of Maidan, where the extensive Korean necropolis are located. The funding for our frequent travels was, in my case, after 2012, through a generous postdoc position in Austria that I had, and the Institute for Geography History for Massimo. Additionally, travels um, for which our expenses were covered by uh, conferences were deeply exploited. Um, and the good thing about the collaborative project, the project where uh, a number of people are involved, is that when someone, one of us, had difficulties or had to do something else, the others kept on going, so the project went on under one form or another. So from 2016, when I was employed at the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences, with the purpose of editing the corpus, of course, everything became much easier. So, one of the basic, basic tenets of our work is the production of drawings. And here you see the photo of a paper squeeze, this is how useful paper squeezes are. Sometimes you, on the squeeze you can see better than you can see on the original stone surface. So um, squeezes were very helpful when it came to drawing. All the drawings were done by Massimo Perna, who needed to have one hand to do the whole work. 
and uh, the majority was corrected either by him or myself on the spot again. Um, it has to be stressed that drawings of stone inscriptions, um, through of which a GM prehistoric epigraphy has no experience of, were greatly uh, facilitated by these squeezes. Um, we also added in the publication some photographs of these squeezes in order to see. Unfortunately, when the stone inscription is too consumed, even the squeeze is of little use to us for a safe reading of an inscription, and the drawing has to be corrected on the spot. Also problematic are inscriptions painted on clay pots, in which usually the paint dissolves into the clay and signs are deformed. So there's little to be done there sometimes. A decision also had to be taken on how to execute the drawing of inscriptions found on convex surfaces, mostly on clay pots. It was decided that each sign would be photographed separately. You see here how it circles. And I took photos of each sign separately and then joined them. And the drawing was made based on the combined photographs. Throughout the past years, a lot has changed in our way of thinking about the corpus because all this process that I'm describing is about the most traditional you can get in the world of epigraphy. So we're basing our, our work on um, a discipline that is very old and has a lot of standard traditions. But things are a bit different nowadays, so a lot has changed. Uh, new developments in digital technologies, such as digital pho photography, for instance, have facilitated the swift and detailed photographic documentation of our material. Since most of the corpora of the Aegean scripts have been completed by the late 1990s, they, were only, they only made use of analog photography. It is the Edition Holistique des Textes Chiffres in 2007 by Jean-Pierre Olivier that first made use of digital technologies, digital photography be more precise, to be followed by Silvia Ferrara's Corpus of Cybermino and uh, inscriptions in 2012, and now to be followed by our first Millennium Secret Inscriptions Corpus. Of course, all corpora or supplementa that are now under preparation make use of digital technologies, and some appear to have taken a step even further to RTI technology. So here, and because the cyber Aegean family of syllabic scripts that contains linear B and the separate syllabary share many documentation problems in common, I will show you an example from the documentation of clay linear B tablets for virus in Massinia with RTI imaging. It's a joint project by the University of Cincinnati, uh, who did, um, they are the ones that did the original excavations in Pylos, the University of Texas at Austin, where Kevin Pluta, one of the contributors, works, in the University of Boulder in Colorado, where Dimitris Nagasis, whom you see in the photo, works. It is the only systematic effort so far to document syllabic documents through novel techniques, and the enterprise has generated some skepticism. Why might that be? Because there are some issues with the use of these new technologies, and as our colleagues who are responsible for this project at MEET, their effort started as a way to dispense with the authority of the editor of texts, because the editor of texts is a small dictator, mm -hmm. so they wanted to be a bit more democratic about it. The traditional ways of documenting and presenting our material relied a lot on a series of mediators, namely the editor, the illustrator, and even the photographer. They wanted to put the primary material at the disposal of more researchers, so that researchers, or people in general can judge for themselves what the correct reading of the tablet description would be. Yet, as they say, it is not possible to substitute for the human expertise that of a trained paleographer. And this is where I would be skeptical with our concerted effort to dethrone the king, that is, the editor of the text. Although I appreciate their thoroughly democratic intention to diffuse the primary material to a wider audience, I doubt whether a wider audience, meaning relevant scholars or even members of the learned public, um, I doubt whether this audience is in a position to actually make use of this primary data and read this material. So, technological
technological advances are not only changing the way our material is documented, but they are also, and more importantly, changing the way our material will be communicated to the scholarly public or the general public in the future. Printed editions are already not the only diffusion method available. PDFs are the closest electronic version, but the future apparently holds even more, including online text editions. And it is safe to assume that none of us works on the material without the compilation of a database of one form or another, like ours for our project, for instance, uh, a simple file maker that you see here. Not so simple. That said, in our field of the Cypher G and family of scripts, we have three online resources for the study of Linear B. The first one is called Damos, a database by our colleague Federico Aurora, a Linear B scholar based at the University of Oslo. Liber, a database by our colleagues Maurizio Del Ferro and Francesco Di Filippo, who are based in Rome. And Calibra, a database of photographs, just photographs of linear B tablets, based in Cambridge and containing photos of documents from Pylos, which is the most expensive archive so far. So from our part, the Corpus of Inscriptiones Grecian, which is a 200-year-old enterprise. It has already moved into digital editing by offering transcriptions as well as translations of inscriptions online. We have to keep in mind that our texts are published by a private editor, the Groiper, who also holds the copyright of their publication. Uh, there's therefore a limited amount of material that is actually allowed to go online, and this is a serious problem for our work, I think, generally speaking. It is the same problem faced by the administrators of the databases I mentioned earlier, uh, that of who holds the copyright of images and material in general, and we know how big that problem in archaeology is. A total of 10 Inscriptiones Grecia fascicles volumes is already available online, with new editions prepared simultaneously for the printed as well as the online edition. And I need to point out that whatever is online is exactly what we have in the volumes, because that would be another problem of electronic editions. If you decide to offer a different version, people might not be able to quote you on that. So if you keep on changing the reading of your texts and interpretations, it might be a problem in the future. So we choose to put online exactly what is printed, so as not to confuse the people. The benefit is that the online edition gives us the possibility to offer a translation of inscriptions in as many languages as we want. And we know from the <coughs> Academy's uh, data that a lot of people look up the translations. So they don't need the original text anymore. A lot of people go directly to the translation, which is either in German or in French or in English, but they want the translated text in order to have something to work with. Preparation of the digital edition takes place concomitantly with the editing of the printed volume so that both editions will appear more or less at the same time. It is our ambition to offer a working tool for epigraphists and ancient historians that will not only be the standard reference work for many years to come, as all inscriptions as Greek volumes have been so far for the past 200 years, but will also be in a position to reach wider audiences of experts and learned public alike such as electronic editions only can in our times. Thank you very much. Thank you, Artemis. I hope you understand that if you think that archaeologists are weird, epigraphies are more weird. It's like this, it's, it's very, it's, 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 it's a fact, yes. Yeah. And, uh, and now after this I understand why the people of Paphos, we cannot understand them here, because even then you can't different things, the Paphia, man, it's and something a, else. It's a, it's a 3,000 year old problem. Yes, it really is. I'm sorry people from Paphos, but it's a historical fact. Yeah, yeah. I'll uh, Questions? Coins in Phoenician. So um, 
The exceptional thing here is that we have the king of a city, which is uh, um, the inscriptions of which are otherwise in Greek, or we do have an, uh, a number of names in Ethio Cypriot as well. But uh, all of a sudden, you get the king with a Phoenician name, written in syllabic and everything. And this particular king was also peculiar in that in the verse, he wrote in the syllabary and in the reverse in the Phoenician alphabet. And this is a unique instance. So there's something going on there. For some reason, he was allowed to do that. He could do that. But it's a definite mixture of the Phoenician element with the, the local city. Another question. About balance. I mean, the syllabic script probably was created for a language, which is uh, like a sequel of a consonant. I mean, okay, some vowel, like a it was just a vowel, but also consonant vowel. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's quite convenient, but for the European languages, it wasn't very convenient. Uh, I would assume that uh, language was created for had the different balance of, of the same uh, This is one of the reasons, because we think that the original language that was created for was the A. The rest of the languages just followed suit. Uh, they adopted a writing system for their own needs. This is one of the reasons why we think that linear A is not Greek, does not record the Greek language, because it is not very, shall we say, adequate for the writing of Greek. Uh, on the other hand, I need to say their defense, because I can read it and I'm fine with it, <laughs> so it is usable. Um, every writing system has the same degree of difficulty for someone who does not know the language. We don't realize that, but being able to read with ease, this happens not only because we have years of training starting when we're five, six years old. It takes a long time for us to read uh, with uh, fast, to read well and to read uh, in an automatic manner. But at the same time, and we don't realize this, we read well because we know the language. So first of all, we are language users, which we start learning from the moment of birth in our house and everything. When we go to school and we start getting our training in writing, we're already very eloquent language users. So we know the language very well, and the writing system just supplements. There's no writing system which corresponds exactly, except for Italian, like, you know, there are some languages that are more faithful to their writing systems, and some others, like English, for example, is a, is a nightmare. You know, everybody knows that. Congratulations for your excellent Now, a different question. Considering this uh, writing system for the last 4,000 years, but I would extend this uh, little further back to symbolic language. 40,000 years. Language or symbolic, writing? Symbolic language. Language or writing? Writing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Writing. Sleep of the time. Okay. <laughs> uh, the inscriptions of the drawings on caves, mm -hmm. 40,000 years. Mm -hmm. Now, for considering both periods, I wanted to ask you whether uh, you have um, come across any correlations, I would say, correlations even, of the symbolic systems of notation, yes. let's say, <laughs> and the latest symbolic uh, language. How do we call it? We come across any correlations and uh, the development of innovations, whether architectural innovations or trading or cultural innovations? So, uh, I think the basic question would be first of all, what, we, what do we call writing? Because there's a, a broad definition of writing, one that can accommodate also the primary forms that you mentioned, like uh, a drawing transmits a message, and the message can be taken as some sort of language, some sort of script that so communicates. So yeah. Okay. In order to make our lives easier, we tend to go for the uh, 
um, narrower definition of writing, that it is a communication system and its basic merit is that it transmits language, speech. Whereas we do not assume for these early drawings, cave drawings, that they communicated some form of speech. They communicated the message, but the message was not a spoken message. It was maybe an idea, it was maybe some notion or something. So we tend to distinguish them because if you, if you take the broader, uh, then, then we move on to semiology rather than um, linguistics and, and uh, epigraphy. This is the problem. Um, then in terms of symbolism, I would only add that the early forms of writing, they had more of an element that we called pictorial, iconographic. So they tended, uh, the first writing systems seem to have been created by imitation of animate and inanimate objects. So you had a chair, or you had uh, a bovine. You would draw that, and that would time, it would be because writing is a convention. We can decide whatever we want, we have to agree between us. So you take this drawing, and you decide that you call the head of the bovine and A, for instance, which is the famous theory of how the Phoenician alphabet came to existence. Um, it is probable that this is the process through which writing was created at the beginning. And it seems that at some stages of their development, some writing systems were more faithful to their pictorial prototypes. So when they were, when they were meant to draw a chair, they drew a very accurate chair. But with time, an abstraction, they tended to be more minimal for in order to facilitate their work, so it was lost. So at the end of this road, we don't really know what the prototype was, what is the connection with the previous periods, when the prototype was created and everything. We have very little evidence. Uh, I mean, have you established any relationship, correlation between the development of the writing system and Research in innovation, agricultural innovations, whether the development of the writing system helped hmm. the development of agricultural or uh, cultural innovation. Okay, this is a fact that all um, the writing systems that we have some information about how they were created, they were not created to write poetry or history, they were created to be administrative tools. So. Writing is connected, the invention of writing is connected with the development of organized states and state administration. So it was meant to, it was a tool, it was meant to implement something and to facilitate. In that sense, when the state, which is a powerful tool on its own, when it has these powerful tools in its hands, it becomes more organized and more effective. So we think that one of the reasons of the success of the early states in Mesopotamia and Egypt was also administration which was based on these writing systems as well. Thank you. I got your question. I'd like to clarify. Yeah. So we had uh, somehow Ethio Cretan Cyprus. No. Yeah. It was borrowed from the uh, from Crete, yeah. the linear A. Yes. In the meantime the Martinians went to Crete and they developed that uh, the minimum A to linear, linear B. Yes. Later on, in the around the 15th and the 13th century, 12th century, the Martinians came to Cyprus. Yes. And they found a script which was related to that. Yes. And they developed it again yes. into the secret syllabary. Yes, right? Yes. This is, this is how it yes. happened. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we, think, we think that the Greeks that came to Cyprus were probably illiterate. They sent off the, the, the worst ones. <laughs> and, but because they brought nothing from Linear B with them, Linear B just disappeared. It just disappeared. So if people who came here, Greek-speaking populations, did have some relation with the state formations that used Linear B, they certainly didn't show it. There's no, no effect, no nothing, nothing to show for it. Instead, uh, it was an internal Cypriot development. So starting from the 16th century onwards, it was probably just a change of language. That was the only change that occurred. So it is not weird, isn't it? Well, I mean, because of the, the, from the material culture, but from the Mycenaean stuff that you have here, they're not like petty things. They're they're 
Yeah, but, but, but you probably, I mean, the, the one who got away was the potter and not the and child. Right, right, okay. <laughs> so they came with it, could be, it could be as simple as this. Yeah. Because it's not, uh, I mean, language, language dies when, when the last uh, speaker dies. But with writing, because it was not such a diffuse technology, it's not so hard to lose it. But there was always a small circle of literate people and um, these literate people, they did not write for fun. So somebody ordered them to do that. If there's no, no boss around to order them to write, they didn't. Or they forgot, or they didn't know. Because they, they weren't illiterate. I mean, they, were, they were supposed to, according to mythology and legends, they were kings. I mean, like, uh, there's no evidence that the king, uh, kings were the literate ones. No, no, because don't, uh, yeah, I think we have fused that. Fuser, okay. No, no, mm. writing, writing, handwriting is, is uh, manual work. Manual work in the history of humanity was never valued. So someone who knew how to write was not a superior person, he was a manual worker. There's no reason why this worker had to be a king. The kings didn't have to do anything. He ordered them. Yeah, the was, you, you have someone else yeah. writing for you. This, this is exactly what happened. Say Praxandros was not a king, he was a uh, common person who came and built uh, lavatos and uh, had baths, Carinia. But did he know what to write? You don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, uh, ah, Emma, please talk.